two issues. First of all, the issue that you've touched upon, uh, Catherine Bennett, of the additional costs of um, um, getting authorisation um, signed off by two agencies, the ASA and, and the CAA. Again, have Airbus done any uh, analysis of the cost to your business, if that was necessary? Um, not, to a certain, not to a huge amount, because as I said, we will still have influence on ARSA, so we'll be able to get our certifications. It's, that's more of an issue for so, other So let me ask Paul Everett the same question for the sector. You know, the CAA is not going to. It has no plan to recreate the capabilities that EASA has. So the, for, for companies, what that means was that your only option would be um, effectively to go to EASA and ask them to do the work. So that's what they call a third country. We'd have a third country status. We, instead of currently, there are very fat rates for the various different types of certification. As a third country, effectively, we would pay by the hour for the expertise that the, the, the uh, European body would uh, kind of allocate in order to get our particular product or, or process or facility certified. We actually produced a, a Learned Society paper uh, on uh, civil aviation regulation in, in, back in September, which, which runs through quite a lot of the story, of, uh, so uh, we can certainly make that available. Um, but I think it, it's, we need to start back at the fundamental that aerospace is a global uh, enterprise. So it starts with the Chicago Convention, it starts with ICAO, which is a global body which the UK is represented on. We use EASA at the moment as our means of de demonstrating compliance with the, the global standards. And it's not just in development uh, of aircraft, it's not just in certification of products, it's in certification of our airports, it's in certification of our people, it's in education standards or uh, training standards to allow people to actually work on aeroplanes. So it's, it's all pervasive. Um, and the, uh, right now, we back very much above our weight uh, in EASA. It is very widely recognized that UK expertise is hugely influential. Therefore, we are able to shape the global regulation regime to suit the UK. We are full members of EASA. We are management board members. If it comes to a vote, which it very rarely does because they tend to do things by consensus, if it comes to a vote, we are a voting member. That is the influence we seek to maintain because that is really important for our membership all our people, I, you know, we are a global body, so I, I represent both the other side of the equation, if you like, who gain benefit from the UK being such active members of EASA, as well as UK industry, who very much clear, believe that, that EASA is the right route for them to be able to bring their products to market. So, but it is that ability of the UK to have influence on the global regulatory regime that it's really hard to see how we would sustain that same level of influence were we to become national. And one of the conversations I had, which I thought was a, it was a phrase that really stuck in my mind, you know, aviation safety has come on leaps and bounds in the last 20 years. Aviation is safer than it's ever been by orders of magnitude. And that is because of the, the work of the collaborative environment and common standards between, in particular, the FAA and the EASA. And the, view, the, the, the phrase that was used to me the other day, that in, when it comes to safety, sovereignty has no place. Safety is something that affects yeah, we want our people flying in whichever airline they choose to, to, to use to know that they're operating to a common set of standards which are the same standards that we would apply to our own airlines. And the way to do that is being part of the global community. We are all safer on airplanes because of our membership of the ELSA? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and that is dem demonstrably the case that, that aviation safety has accelerated as a result of the formation of the ELSA. Thank you. It seems to me that there is a risk that we leave the European Union and we don't have the certification. We had this issue last week when we were taking evidence on cars, but I think this might be of an order of magnitude uh, greater than that. Uh, so if we leave without a deal, what does chaotic actually mean, Paul Everett? So the challenge is for us to understand, if you like, we're still challenging ourselves to understand what, what the continuity or what the fallback position is in the event that nothing is signed. Okay, so, so our working assumption in those cases is that we have no relationship with the European Aviation Safety Agency. If we have no relationship with the European Aviation Safety Agency, 
Will we have any bilateral agreements in place with any of our other major partners like the, the US, uh, Canada or, or others? Um, in those circumstances, then our, our regulatory regime is effectively um, non-functioning because whilst all the people are the same, all the processes are the same, if, it is, if there's no mechanism for recognition of it, then effectively it has no value or validity. In the circumstances where it has no valid validity, then how can we sell anything? We can't. And similarly, as, as Simon has touched upon, there's a, there's a broader range of issues around the maintenance of aircraft, the people doing the maintenance of those aircraft. If they are not uh, recognized as being appropriate people to do that work, then even if they've done the work, that the aircraft won't be regarded as being fit to fly. So, you know, it's chaotic because we don't know exactly what arrangements may or may not be put in place in order to try and um, bridge that gap. We're assuming that nobody really wants a chaotic situation. But as I've said, if we are not an EU member state, then a whole bunch of stuff falls away and we have to have separate international agreements in place. I don't know the, to the extent to which the Department of Transport, as an example, has you know, is moving forward, if you like, in, in putting those into place. We know that work is going on, but I have no idea, if you like, how much progress that they've, they've, they've genuinely made. So I, I think you would see it as there's a, a very short period where, you know, people go, we don't really know what's happening, so we, we need to take a safety first approach, so nothing happens. There's a slightly longer period where we assume that there will be some kind of uh, arrangement that allows the real world to carry on, because, again, as I was saying, you know, some of the things are not specifically aerospace related, so stuff like the common transport area, you know, moving goods through, through customs and that kind of stuff are not, not ones that are solely you know, impacting us, they'll impact all sectors. So you know, it's likely to see some, some very uncertain days immediately after the end of March. Hopefully we would find you know, within a relatively short period of time some level, but what that might be you know, at this point in time we, we are not sure. In, in. Well, I was uh, flying away on holiday in the Easter holidays of 2019 and my aeroplane had a British component in it. As a representative of the industry in this country, Paul Everett, would you be able to guarantee that my flight would be able to take off? Um, well, so uh, from an aerospace, I'm sure it would, the component would be of a high quality and uh, meet all the appropriate standards. Um, I can't tell you. And the truth is I can't tell you. And that's, you know, that's, that's a worry. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's even a bigger worry if you talk to the airlines. Yeah. So basically we're in a situation today that if we have a hard Brexit without a deal, it can't be guaranteed that people will be able to fly on the 30th of March 2019. I couldn't be certain. Thank you very much. We are told that being uh, under the jurisdiction of the ECJ is a red line for the government. Um, Paul Everett, could you tell us roughly how many rulings the ECJ has made on aerospace issues and how many of them have adversely affected either UK interests or UK companies? I think off the top of my head I can't think of any. I think in, in, even in the ARSA, which would be the primary, there have only been, I think, I think there's been three in the last five years or something like that where there was some kind of dispute that had to be resolved. Uh, it, you know, from a day-to-day -day perspective, you know, ECJ does not, in, you know, we, we, it's not a sort of constant in our lives or a concern that we have.